have our privilege to have a guest speaker from the Pinhead Institute twice this month. Um, we're going to have Jessica introduce her again, um, but we're here for another presentation. I think it's going to be pretty qual high quality presentation. Mrs. Dozel? We're going to see the other half. Where do they live? I will go there. We're not ready. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we're cold. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, can we throw your hands up, please? Okay. All right. So everything I just said now applies. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here so soon again. I saw most of you very recently. Um, so we're obviously trying to turn you all into the budding doctors. <laughs> This year, at least, because we have another great guest speaker who is a doctor today. This is um, Dr. Valerie Sharp, and she is an eye doctor up in Telluride. In fact, I think she's the only eye doctor with an office in San Diego County. So she's a pretty useful person to know. But um, we are going to talk all about eyeballs, which we all have, right? So it should be pretty fascinating. And we have a little bit of time for this. We'll let I take it away. Do you have everybody here to start? Your brain that can process. 
but there's other things you need to do. We understand that our eyes work together, right? And so we understand that if one eye's doing, looking this way and one eye's looking that way, that's not good. Okay, because you would be seeing two worlds and things would not be going together. And people that have problems with that have double vision, which is, trust me, a not fun way to live. Okay, has anyone ever had double vision? Okay, good. And so it's kind of can be, kind of make you feel weird. Not very fun. Okay, so the development of these visual skills, we're going to mainly focus on kind of human development right now, is happening rapidly, okay, once a baby is born, and really for the, for the next three years, is really um, happening as they interact with their environment. Okay, so they're interacting with their parents, they're not interacting with the things around them like toys and everything. Okay, in some, in some children this doesn't develop normally. Okay, so the eye muscles don't move right. Sometimes they have certain other things wrong. And then some people develop this in childhood but then have an injury, generally a brain injury, and they lose the ability to do this. So within science, it's a very complex system. And we have learned more about how different parts of the brain work when things go wrong. So someone had an injury to a certain part of their head, and then they lost a certain ability. So we actually have learned, have learned about that through injury and how they regain those skills with therapy. I like to think about the visual system as a bicycle. Okay? It's very complex. There's gears, there's handlebars, there's a lot of things going on. And this visual organ is really important because your vision represents about 70% of the information that your brain is processing every day. Okay? All the faces that I'm seeing, all the eyeballs that are right in front of me, that feels very natural and isn't too disorganized, but it takes a lot of energy to put all that together so it instantly feels like you know what you're looking at. Okay? So when you think about this analogy of a bicycle, let's say you got, I just had my first meal at the Happy Belly Deli, which was awesome. So let's say you guys had to ride a bicycle to the deli from here. Which of these three bikes are you going to pick? <laughs> yes. The yellow. the yellow one. And why are you picking the yellow one? Because it looks like it works. It looks <laughs> like it works, okay? And so what, do you think, what, do, what would happen if you tried to ride that bike? It falls apart. It fell apart. Now let's say it works really well. I mean, you, it got you from A to B, but what do, you, do you think it would take a little more energy to get that bike to the deli? Yes. yes. And would it make more noise? Yeah. Yeah, and do you think the, gear, and the gears would kind of move slowly? Yes. Okay, and what do you think about this bike? Are you going to take that bike to the deli? No. No, why? You should know that bike isn't going to go for 10 feet. Right, I know. So, this is a good analogy to understand what's happening with the visual system when it goes wrong. When you have those 17 skills, when they work well together, you have an efficient system. And it's easy for me to walk and talk down the hallway, for you to have fun at lunch with your friends and eat and talk at the same time. But if your vision system is like this bike, it works, but it just takes so much more energy to do everything else that someone that is riding the yellow bike does not have to expend that energy. And people get tired and they get headaches, okay? And they don't want to do things like read in school and they avoid visual tasks. If you have, if you have this bike and that's your vision, I mean, you're not learning to read. You're not doing a lot of things that are gonna make you very productive in this world. And school becomes very hard, okay? So a lot of times with vision, because it's not like a cut on your arm, it's not something we can really see directly, it's hard to get this to come out, but ultimately, that's, that's the way I like to think about it. And so my goal as a clinician is to make everybody's system like the yellow bike, okay? And sometimes I work with this, and sometimes I work with this, okay? And there's different specialists within my world that help with that. Okay, so when we talk about some of these 17 skills, we're gonna highlight just a few of them. The first one that I think is really important, and it's a huge um, evolutionary development for various um, animals would be binocularity. And that is when you have two eyes looking at one thing. You put it into one image. But because you have two cameras that aren't exactly in the same place, you understand depth and where that is in the space of your world, okay? So that is basically 3D vision, or the clinical scientific term for that would be stereopsis, okay? So roll that pencil over to me, okay? So 
you knew where the pencil was. You instantly went for it. And when I saw it, I grabbed it. If you don't have two eyes, you kind of know it's there, but you may grab it like this and miss it, okay? That's an undershoot or an overshoot, okay? And we do that all naturally, most of us in this room, but some people have problems with that, and we have to help them develop that skill. I like to think about the eyeballs as two TVs, and so your brain is basically watching those two TVs and putting that information together. And so if we just go back to that one component, which is the acuity, the clarity, that's the 2020 component. Um, if you have a glass of prescription that is different, so one eye is pretty clear and one eye is blurry, the brain is just going to ignore the blurry eye. It only pays attention to information that's helpful. So why that's important in my world is if this happens with a child, and much younger than you guys, we're talking about the ages between zero and maybe six. Then basically, if we don't get that image cleared up, the brain is not going to develop a strong connection to that eyeball. And even if they get glasses later in life, it won't have developed cells that see, that see very small things. Okay, so we have a critical window within the visual development where we have to fix these things. Or, and so if you put glasses on someone, then there's, then there's a clear window and the brain starts listening to that side, okay? So have you ever heard or seen, it, it doesn't happen as quite as much anymore because we do the therapy differently, but have you seen someone that had over a patch and you've heard of that? Okay. Has anybody done that in this room? Excellent. So what happens is, is that if we have one good eye and one eye that's, that had a fuzzy image, we put the glasses on, but the brain doesn't suddenly just instantly turn that eye on. So what we do in clinic is we actually have them wear a patch on the, bat, on the good eye and force the brain to start listening to that eye that initially it didn't preference. And then after you do that for a couple months, then basically the brain has now learned to use that eye, and now we have that equal miss that we need to have in the vision system. Okay? A lot of, we used to have, a, like when I started doing this 15 years ago, we used to patch people all the time, all day. So you had, in, in your school life, you would have seen kids walking around with black patches, which is not very cool, right? So no one wanted to do it. And now we can do this more with just a couple hours doing video games at night. Okay. Another important skill is tracking. So what's amazing is not only does your brain have to put together all these colors and lights and motion and things, but it also has to judge where the eyes are gonna move to follow whatever you wanna see. Okay, so if we take this back to the animal kingdom, eyes are primarily important because we need to find food. And so if you're racing after a zebra, okay, then basically you have to track that, okay, so you can find it. And so we have, all, we have six eye muscles that are attached to our eyeball, and four of them make it go up, down, left, and right, and then two of them make it do what we call a cyclo-rotation, where it goes sideways and back. And so they have to be coordinated to move all together. So that's 12 muscles that have to work very well together. And sometimes there can be problems with that. Another thing is you have to track. And so when we read, we're reading horizontal, right? And we're starting at the left side of the page and moving to the right and then tracking back. And so that's a skill that if you have problems doing that left to right, you will not do well reading English, okay? And I mention it like that because in other countries, can you think of another way that um, some languages are written? Yes. Reading from right to left. Yes, and then what's another way? Up and down. So what's interesting is in, country, in areas of the world where we read more horizontal, we have to do a lot more therapy with people that have problems with the muscles going this way. But in more in Asia, where a lot of the like Chinese languages and stuff are vertical, they don't have that issue because they're not going left to right. They have more problems when they have the vertical. Okay, so it just is a good example about how your function is based on what you have to do. And if you don't have to do something a lot, it's not going to magnify it as a problem. So we have gross tracking, which is when you're tracking a soccer ball or a basketball. And then we have fine tra tracking, which is the example I just used when you read. Visual 
processing is another component that I want to talk about that is just when all this information goes back to your brain. And your brain has to superimpose basically the two televisions on top of each other to make one image. And then has to put together this motion so it's organized. And that's a very complicated neuroscience topic that we can do for about a week if you guys want to do this in spring break. Okay, so all I want you to take from this that's really the take home and the bottom line is that your vision is so much more than just seeing clearly. And it's just truly a fascinating system. So you can obviously tell I think the eyeballs kind of off. And so how did we get to this amazing organ that can do all these things? Well, well now we're going to dig deep and go way back in biology and evolution and science, okay? And so the development of what we understand as the, as the human eye started about 500 million years ago, okay? Single cell organisms. So you guys have done some of this in science, right? Have you done some of the microscope stuff yet? Raise your hand. So have you guys seen like some of these like single cell organisms or the slides and pictures of them? Okay, so here's some examples down there. The amoeba, the paramecia, the euglena. And so ultimately, the euglena is used as, a, as an example of how this started, where this particular organism has a tail called the flagellum. And there was a cluster of light-sensitive proteins that every time there was a light, they would turn on, and then that would supercharge the flagellum to move toward that light. And so ultimately, there was, a, there was more food source by the light. And so this type of um, structure and proteins was built into the evolution of this organism because things that eat more reproduce more and have offspring. Okay? So this is where the eye first started. We're jumping probably out of 50 million years. But the flatworm is another example. And this is a pretty basic organism that has two little spots right on the top of their flathead. So they call those eye spots. And then what, had, what started to happen that was really interesting, instead of being flat, these eye spots started to curve in, okay? So this is the picture here. And that curve was preferenced because when the eye, when the eye cells and the light photosensitivity cells were flat, there was no way you could tell if the light was coming from the left or the right. And once you cupped that, you could have that orientation and directional information which was important because then organisms could start moving away from light, which would tend to dry them out or make them too hot. And they could also find shade and hide, which was generally hide from things that would eat them. Okay? So this cup, over a couple million years, grew and grew with various organisms. And then you're now starting to see on the end here what we're getting into is more of the modern shape of the eyeball that we understand. Okay? So these eye spots turned into eye cups, and then they grew bigger. And we finally developed a lens inside, which allowed the light to be focused so we could have basically clarity from farther away. Here's another organism, okay? This is a nautilus. Have you guys ever seen this before? No. I think it's pretty cool. I, I know about this because it's constantly used in the eye world for evolution, but I've never seen one of them or anything. And so basically this is a marine mollusk, okay? And this type of eye development is fairly old. But it evolved when this cup formed, it finally, finally formed, and then there was just this one little point that was open, okay? And so they call this a pinhole camera. And so if you look at this, that's exactly how this eye is formed. And basically a pinhole allows light to go straight through parallel, Versus if you have a wider window, it kind of spreads out and becomes more defocused. So this is a very important point when we are now at the point where light, where this camera is developing to focus things that are farther away from our body. Finally, what ended up happening is basically going back, this, uh, this hole was covered over by a tissue. And we're now going to leap like, really far. But basically, over time, it got covered, partly because that um, advantage was to prevent infection. And then the eyeball filled with fluid. OK, this is a fluid layer we'll talk about later called the vitreous. And basically, that fluid is specifically designed
designed to kind of dumb down the brightness of light, so it supports not being so sensitive to bright light. And then what was really important is this lens developed, okay? So this is the internal zoom lens in a camera. So if you work with kind of more of a, a larger camera and you start to focus it, do you hear the lens inside going, uh, 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 uh. That, is the, that is basically what our natural lens inside of our eye can do. It can bend. So we can see distance, and then we can see up close, and lots of ranges in the middle. So that was a really important step in having an excellent camera and a good eyeball, because you want to be able to see things that are coming at you from far away, but you also want to be able to see like your food source and see things that are up close. So this variable focus was a huge evolutionary moment. Okay, other things that came on board about the same time, you know, at this point, we have a pinhole camera with a lens that's focusing light, okay? We finally got into this color band, okay? And you guys understand this, right? Does anybody know what that's called? Without looking at the slide yet. Tell me. Iris. Iris. And so what are the main colors that we see for the iris? Yes. Green. Green. Good. Brown. Excellent. Anything else? Blue. Blue. Now, can anyone guess and tell me what the, what the most common colored iris over the entire human, the most majority <coughs> iris color for the entire human population would be? Yes. Is it hazel? Hazel, good try. Green. Keep going. Blue. Keep going. Brown. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I let him finish that. We'll get to you in a second. So brown, if you look at the general human population, brown is going to be the majority. Why is that? A brown iris has more pigment. Blue is the color of the iris in the absence of pigment. And green has a little pigment and hazel has a little more. Pigment is basically natural sunscreen. Okay? So in the animal kingdom, are these guys going to the store and buying sunscreen? No. no. They have to make this on their own. Who has had a sunburn in this room? Yuck! Okay? No fun! This is not good for nature to, they have to figure out a way around this. So ultimately the pigment in the eye is protective and that's why we see that. When you have, when you're fair skinned and you have blue or green eyes, genetically you are coming from a population that developed in a cold part of the world which didn't have as much sunlight. And that was more of a lot of our ancestry from like Northern Europe, okay? Excellent. And the other thing that the iris does is it's the aperture of the camera. Can anyone tell me what an aperture is? It's the hole in a camera that makes it really big or really small. So if you're taking, if you're a photographer and you're taking night pictures, you're going to make that aperture bigger so that you can absorb more light. And our iris does the same thing. <laughs> So you've seen your own pupil, right? That black part is the pupil. That's the hole where the light goes through. And does it get bigger or smaller when you go into a dark room? It gets bigger. Okay? So we have this basically hole that's built to get bigger when we need more light to see what we want to see, and then smaller when it's bright. The sclera develops. So this, the sclera is the white part of the eye. Okay, we all have this part. And so it's a very tough layer. And so it's developed to add protection. Okay, because you want that eyeball to be strong. Has ever, anybody ever been hit in the eye? See, this happens a lot. Now, who's had to have surgery after they've been hit in the eye? And nobody's hand goes up, which is a really good thing, because I wasn't thinking that was gonna be the answer. But, all that means is that we have a lot of protection and security built into keeping our eye very healthy. It's a good thing. Okay? If you noticed all the examples of what I used when we talked about the small organisms that eventually that were the first animals to have eyeballs, where were they living? In the water or on the land? Water. Water. So ultimately our eye has been built as kind of an underwater camera. The only problem is we don't live underwater. Okay, so do you know what part of the eye helps now keep our eye wet? Yes. Okay, the back. The tear duct. The tear duct. Okay. The tear duct is actually where they drain. The tear gland 
is what secretes the tears, and it lives right up here, okay, kind of behind your eye, okay, in the corner. And it basically makes a water salt solution that comes through these little pores and keeps your, the front of your eye very wet, okay? And so what happens when we get sad? Cry. And so what do you think is happening biologically when you cry? Yeah. Are you making too many tears or less tears? Mm -hmm. Too many. So there's, there's basically neuro neurology, which is the nerves and how they're, there's a feedback loop that if you get emotional, this tear gland will go into overdrive. And then it can't handle that volume, so everything goes over the edge. Okay? As we age, we make less tears. <coughs> and so that's pretty common across the general population. And sometimes people's eyes get very dry, especially when they live in a very dry place like Colorado. <coughs> especially where it's dry in the winter, like it is here. And so a lot of times they come to me because their eyes are very scratchy and irritated. And I spend a lot of my time helping people use different drops and tools to fix that. Yeah? Because my always, my always hurts right here. It always hurts right there? Yeah. Does it ever go away? That's not good. You may have to talk about that after this. <laughs> All right, so we've talked about the eyeball and how it evolved. But ultimately, we, want to, we also want to highlight the computer and the back of the arm, okay? I mean, the back of the brain. So you guys, have you guys learned about the cerebral cortex and all the different parts? Heard about this a little bit. Okay, we'll do a quick, like, two-second review of neuroanatomy, okay? So there's a frontal cortex, which is the part of your brain right under the skull here. And this does a lot of things, but ultimately, it is the reason why you are you. Okay, your personality, your understanding of the world, how you talk and act, and makes you you is right here. And we understand that because sometimes people get, this gets damaged. And then when they wake up, they're walking and talking, but they're not acting like themselves. Okay? And the people that love them, that live with them, are saying things like, you know, this is not this person. There's a part over here that has to do with how you speak. So have you ever heard of someone that lost their speech generally after a stroke? Has anyone ever had that happen to a grandparent or anything? Because that's a common thing that is affected. And so people can sometimes re be retrained to speak, but they have to kind of start over, which is very hard and frustrating. On another side of the brain over here, it has to do with our hearing and how we understand the, the verbal world. And so there's a connection with the motor of what we say and what we hear, and so sometimes that gets damaged. And then way in the back here is what we call the visual cortex. And so that's a very important por portion of the brain that I concentrate on a lot. Because if sometimes some people come to me, not because they have an eye problem, but because they have damage to this part of their brain, and they can't see things the way we see things anymore. Okay? Sometimes it can be very interesting. They can lose the entire ability to see everything on the left side of the world. It's sometimes black, but even worse, sometimes they don't even know it's there. And we call that visual neglect. And so they, their brain can't even process anything on the left side. So they just don't think about it. They don't know about it. They forget to brush half their hair. They forget to brush the other side of their mouth. They run into a lot of furniture. And this is a very challenging way to live their life. Okay, so it just, I'm using that example as we should have a lot of respect for all these things that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis that we don't have to think about. As the eye was developing, this section of the brain got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So when we're, when we're looking at animals and how they see and what they see, part of that research with scientists is really about taking their brain apart and figuring out how much of that brain is being used for this. Because if you have a little piece of your brain that's processing this, that probably means that you don't really need vision as much as some animals. Versus animals like birds, over 50% of their brain is built to do vision. So that means that you really need to see well. And so when you're flying, you do need to see well. And that's part of it. So this whole um, system is basically called coupled evolution. Okay, so you have one part of the body, that's evolving as the same as the other. Okay, fun facts about your vision. 
Did you guys know we actually see the entire world upside down? Our eyeball is built to have an inverted image. So when you're looking at a tree, like in this picture here, the top of the tree goes straight down to the bottom of the film of your camera, the retina. The bottom of the tree goes to the top, and then inside of your head you have this flipped image. It goes back to your brain with a cable called the optic nerve, and fortunately your brain works that out. Okay, so that's really nice to know. Sometimes when people do have injuries, this system goes awry. And so they wake up and they're seeing the world upside down. That is not a fun way to live. It'll reorganize generally after a few weeks, but that is a very memorable experience. Okay, adaption in animals. Who in this room has a dog? Okay, dogs see less color than we do. Anatomically, we have three different cells in our eyes as humans that make all the colors in the world that we see. Dogs only have two. So basically, they're seeing mostly yellows, blues, and then everything else is gray. So this is important if you want to buy your, if you want to buy your dog a chew, you want it to be blue or red. What would be more interesting to your dog? Blue. blue. Yep. Right? So red is going to show up more gray to them. And blue and yellows are going to have the colors that, that would be more exciting and interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of my dogs loves comes over and he kind of like is working with time and stuff. He taught us that dogs can't see TV screens and neither can cats because they can They can see a bit things moving. Right. They can't see the other side of the TV so they can't really see the screen. Yep. And that is really cool. I did not know that fact. I'm going to have to look that up and put that in one of my presentations in the future. But we're going to talk about that quick motion vision in a minute, and you're absolutely right. Yeah? Like, aren't we, like, like colorblind kind of, like, when you see, like, that color or something, it's, like, not actually that color. Your eyes are just seeing it that way. Exactly. If you go back to that statement, when all we really have as our vision is chemical impulses, okay? And so color, is only something that is, that is being invented by a computer, and that computer is your brain. Yes? Like, what happens, like, to make you go colorblind? Very good question. Anybody here colorblind? Okay. And so what colors can you not see? Yes, and I knew the answer to that. Because 80% of colorblind is in males, and it is red and green colorblind. And that's because ultimately, in, basically, it's a little dumbed down. When you talk about color vision in humans, we don't say that we have red color cells and green color cells and blue color cells. What we say is that in science, we have one color cell that sees the spectrum of 150 um, wave, nano wavelength to about 400. And that would be the ranges that mostly do reds. And then we have low light, which is mostly blues. And so it's the wavelength of the spectrum. And so there is a very, very common hereditary condition called red-green color blindness. And it has to be passed from a mom. So you guys have learned this XY chromosome deal. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Okay. So when you are female, there's a few here. You're a girl, raise your hand, right? You have two X chromosomes, and you got one from your mom. If you were a male, you have an X and a Y. And so you got this from your, the X from your mom and the Y from your dad. This specific genetic trait comes on the X chromosome. So typically, it's going to be males because the girls have another X that can kind of overwrite this. Does that make sense? We could talk about this for another hour. <laughs> but ultimately, we see this more, about 80% of color blindness is only in boys, okay? But you can do it. I mean, do you feel like that's a problem? And the reason why it isn't a problem is because he doesn't know any different. And what is your name? Zane. Zane, okay. Zane has never seen red and green. So guess what? He just rolls with it. <laughs> okay, right? So you learn the grayscale. Hold on one second. You learn the grayscale, and sometimes maybe it's a little harder, but you get it, right? Yeah. And so that's just because you only have problems with things that are suddenly different. If this is the only way it's ever been for you, you're gonna do okay. Yes? Well, what color does he see? Well, he'll tell you, he can talk. <laughs> <laughs> can you talk a little louder so he can hear you? Well, just, I mean, you can basically see all the color 
colors, but it's a little more gray, right? That's the general answer that I hear. Yeah, so it's not like, you know, the red and greens are completely gone. It's just like they look a little more gray now. Okay? Yes? Would it ever be possible to come back from being colorblind? Oh, that's even better. I love these questions. Okay, so if we go back to the definition of what the colorblind is, it is basically a situation where you do not have certain cells to see those colors. So the only way to fix that is to have those cells transplanted. And that's going to be very hard for us to figure out. Okay? This is, as you can see, this is a very complex system. What we are likely going to do in the future, and the, the technology is in its infancy right now, but ultimately we're going to have computer chips. Because all we have, we don't have to make a new eye. All we have to do is basically signal that eye, that those chemical signals that go back to the brain the same way they do now, and then you will see things. So ultimately what's happening is we will likely be, this will be down the road a few years, decades, but ultimately we will be implanting chips in the back of people's eyes, and it will be sending these signals. We probably won't be able to figure it out as much as the natural evolution has. We have very rudimentary implants right now. So they are basically, an ant, they have passed into from animal studies where they do this in animals to human trials. And people that never had vision, they get these implants. There was the first study about 10 years ago. And what's interesting about this is I don't remember the numbers offhand, but ultimately 50%, so what they did is they took people that had never had vision, dark, 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 black. They put these implants in, and all the implants were supposed to do is help them see big shapes, like gray, like they can see the door brown and the white wall, and they can see a few colors, and that's it. 50% of the people that got these implants wanted them out within a year. Anybody have an idea why they wanted them out? Yes? Exactly. This was so visually, this was so disorganized to them that it made them just feel crazy all the time. Okay, and that's because they never developed the section. What would you, when you look at me, when I look at your sea of faces, to someone that had never had vision, this would just be like so disorganized. And so a lot of these people didn't want that. So that's what we have to figure out. It's going to take a while. That's a great question. Okay, goldfish. Goldfish have very similar vision to humans with colors. They just don't have eyelids because, again, they're living in a water environment, so they don't need that adaption. Cats. Cats are very cool. They have to see quick movements. Okay, why do you think they have to see quick movements? Yes? They're trying to catch their food. So predators, hunters are going to have the best vision in the animal kingdom. Okay? Their pupil can get super huge. So this is an oval shape. It's like a little slit. It can almost get as big and cover that entire green area. Okay? Now when you see a picture of cats like this, or you've seen this with deer and different things, you always see that extra glow. Okay? Now sometimes we get that little re red reflex when we take pictures of ourselves, but it's not this bright. And that's because their eyeball has developed a very specific reflective layer in the back. Why do you think they have a reflective layer? Can anyone tell me in the back? So like when they're out at night, like the light reflects back off and they can see better. You guys are good at this stuff. You know, it's just amazing. This stuff is so common sense, but to have this evolve in nature just is amazing. So you're exactly right. They have a reflector. It bounces light twice, and then they get two times the illumination. And that reflector is called the um, tatum lucidum. And so you see this in most nocturnal animals. Yes. So it's like when you see something on the road, Yep. Like exactly. And this layer lives right behind the neurosensory layer of the retina. Okay? And so it stimulates that light twice. Okay, so now we're going to move to a whole different kind of animal. Grazers. Horses are the example. So anything that has to basically um, look down and lean in to get their food. Okay? So they're going to be eating grass. Grazers. Do you think they need very good vision to do that? No. no. So they haven't developed good vision because they didn't need it, okay? What they did need is to run away from things. Yes? That's why their eyes are on the side of their head. Oh, yes. Yeah. So why do you think they're on that side of their head? Because to watch the predators in the morning. 
Exactly. Razor animals are what they call flight animals. Their defense mechanism from getting eaten is running away. So if you want to run away from something, you want a lot of lead time. And so basically, being on the side of their head, they get to see all around them. Our visual field is about right here. Theirs is way back here. Did you want to say something? Uh, well, fish and they just see the side? They're very similar too, because they're ultimately anything that is constantly not trying to be eaten will likely develop this type of high angle vision. Okay? And so predators have a blind spot though. So if you get right, who in this room has a horse? So do you want to be right in front of your horse to sneak up on them? No. No. Coming from the side is going to make them way less squirrely and you're not going to get hit. Okay? The same thing with jumping. They can't see a jump ahead of them. So have you guys ever, has anyone ever jumped and worked with horses and comp competed? And what, you have to, what do you have to do to get them to jump? Like, I haven't done it in a while though. Okay. I mean, when I was like in second grade. And but ultimately you give them a signal, signal, okay? Where they know when to do that because they're not going to be able to see that straight on. Okay, now some fun facts, see if you guys know what's going on here. So what animal has the largest eyeball on the earth? And we have not talked about this yet. This would be just a fun fact that you know. Yes? A cow. A cow. A whale. A whale. Uh, he took it. He took it? Okay. I'm going to give you a couple extra context clues. Yes? A giant squid. A giant squid. So 26 feet long, a thousand pound animal, 11 inch eyeball. That means it's as wide as a ruler. And it was only discovered in 2007. And that would be, he was correct, the giant colossal squid. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Okay, they don't see a lot of these. They live deep in the ocean. Okay, but they do have the largest eyeball that we have down today. What's the second one? Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> you stop me. How big are they? How big are they? So the eyeball, so it's about, it's about as, as wide as a ruler. I don't know the vertical dimension, but ultimately I think that's developed because proportionally they're a bigger animal, right? And then they ultimately are using this vision to find food. Yes? So do you think like, it's like just a perfect circle like how fishes are? Not like ours are oval? Most of these animals are actually a half circle. They don't have a full circle. Okay, invertebrates are a little different than a mammalian eye. Yes? Uh-huh. I like your glasses. Uh, how could a, this is not like about the thing, but how can an 11 pound? 11 inch? I mean, 11 inch eyeball be a thousand pounds. Oh no, you're right, that's impossible. The um, animal is a thousand pounds, not the eye. Uh, yes. So, like with lizards, how they have like the two eyelids and they leave it like one each year because it goes over and then they. Awesome, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, it is. And we're going to look at a picture of that in a minute. But those are membranes. They are not actually eyelids. Yes, in the back of the pain. Um, don't animals have small eyelids? They do. And that's a very good thing. A um, very good point to bring up because, okay, so not a killer whale, because killer whale is more of a predator. But do you guys know what, how a blue whale eats? They're really big. How do they eat? Yes. Do you know? Uh, they eat a blue whale? Yep. I don't know. Uh, what are the whales that eat like all the shrimp, the tiny shrimp? Yes. And so, how do they eat those tiny shrimp? Do you want to tell me? They keep their mouth open, close to the water, and when they have fish in they close their mouth. Exactly. Yes. Were you going to say that too? They suck it in. Yes. They like suck it in. You guys know a lot of this. So, that concept is basically just like, you know, you're just running up to the smorgasbord and eating. There's no hunting involved in that, so therefore you don't need big eyes to do that. Yes? Why do spiders have big eyes? Oh my gosh, these guys are so smart. Are you going to give me a side view? you? I know. <laughs> Seriously, did you see this last night when I was doing this pattern? No. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're doing spiders now. Mosaic 
vision. They see their world as a kaleidoscope, okay? So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eyeballs. They're all looking at the same thing. So if I looked at you, I would see orange gray, orange gray, orange gray, orange gray, okay? If something starts moving, then in one of those TVs, you're gonna see a different picture. And that's what those insects and spiders go for. Yes? Yes, they can have a lot. And so this is the same reason. What insects and spiders are geared for is finding quick, rapid movement. Okay, and if you have 27 TVs and one TV flips to a different channel, you're gonna instantly zero in on that. Oh, like when you try to smack the fly, it just fly away. Yes, and so that's what that's why that's developed. Okay, oh, I went too fast here. So, so yes, mosaic vision is what we see in insects and spiders. Okay? We're gonna yeah, we got a few more minutes. Okay. So hold on. Jump back here. Off birds, okay? Birds really are similar to reptiles, okay? Because birds actually evolved from some of the same factors that reptiles did. Their eyes are not spherical. They see three to four times the, the distance acuity that humans do, okay? So they have supervision with the clarity of seeing very small things. That's why we say you have eagle vision. Is that why, like, they can be beautiful? Yes. They four feet up and see their job, in order to fly, you have to have good vision. Okay, you can't even get your pilot's license unless you have good vision, okay? But ultimately, they have to be able to swoop in and grab little mouse with their talons and swoop out, and that's why they need this kind of vision. Yes, I agree. Um, can you see that little letter? How many eyes does a fly have? How many eyes does a fly have? There is many species of flies, but they tend to have between 10 and like 40. If you, it depends on how you define that, but they have a, a lot of different hands of those Okay. So no eyelids in a bird, it's very similar to what you're talking about as a reptile. They have membranes that close. They detect rapid motion. And what's really cool about birds is they migrate, which we understand, right? But have you ever figured out how they get all the way across the world? Yes. They fly. They fly. Very true. <laughs> How they know where they're going? How do they get to the same spot? Yes. Because like in their head, there's like a north and a south thing. Yes, they have. There's some. There's some this is basically a multi-sensory concept. But one of the ways that they migrate and basically navigate this long journey is they can actually see magnetic waves and fields that we can't see. And the theory is that they can basically look at the horizon and see these wave patterns and follow the polarization with the magnetic field of the Earth that isn't going to change based on weather and different things. It's always going to be the same at these different points of the year. And this helps them get to their final end point accurately. Dolphins. What's really amazing with dolphins, because they are a mammal, is that their biggest job is to avoid getting eaten. So therefore, do you think it's good to be sleeping for eight hours on the bottom of the ocean? No. no. So their brain has developed to have two independent parts. They can sleep with the left side, have the right side awake, and they can have one eye awake. And then they flip 12 hours later. So they're only ever sleeping with half their brain, and therefore they can always basically fight, um, fight off predators by being able to have that mechanism. So, so if, like, if like, like a predator's coming and you start to sleep, They're gonna see it with one eye and start swimming away. How well, the other eyes on the other side? Yes. Well, they use. You're right. That's a good point. But they use others. First of all, they're always they're always swimming, and then they also use smell and hearing. So they're using their other senses. Yes. So when they're awake, do they use 100 percent of their brain? When they're awake, they use 100 percent of their brain. Correct. Okay. This is the eyeball that we understand. Okay. So we're gonna have a handout, and we're gonna have to go kind of fast on this. But these are some of the parts of the eyeball, and you see. How involved it is. Yes? Well, I don't know what type of owls, but there's an owl that has like two, two types of eyes. Yes. What do they. Those, that's a membrane, okay? They have like two, one. It closes this way and closes this way. Yeah. And so it's a membrane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why do they have 
because they're, they're basically derived from the same type of animal as a reptile. And this is basically a skin layer that got really tough. And they have a skin layer that goes horizontal and a skin layer that goes vertical. It's just very different than what we see in mammals. Hold on, guys. I'm going to show you this inside the eyeball one more time, OK? And just so we're not going to have as much time because you guys have asked such awesome questions, which I love. But you're going to have a handout that you can take home. And this is some really good learning about the different parts of the eyeball. And then we're going to ask you these really quick facts here. Who has the sharpest eyesight in the Yes? Anyone else? Cool. Birds of prey, OK? Best underwater vision, 20 seconds. Shark. Shark, right. Best thermal vision. Snake. Snake. Oh, good. Best mammal night vision. Owls. Oh. Cats. Cats. Best motion. <laughs> 